So Dr. Sonia was a clinical associate professor in the Division of Gastroenterology, so we're going south of the border now, thankfully. Um, she sub-specializes in motility with expertise in a variety of disorders, including disorders of the esophagus, and she also serves as associate clinical chief and the division and co-director of the GI course for medical students. So thank you so much for sharing, sharing your expertise with us. Thank you so much for inviting me to be here. So I'm going to change gears a little bit, go a little bit further down. Um, and provide you a really high level overview of esophageal motility. So here we go. Um, so my learning objectives are really to review both diagnostic and therapeutic um, interventions for esophageal motility disorders and describe as many as I can during this uh, 15 minute time frame on the cl certain clinical manifestations um, and diseases um, that in involve, of course, the esophagus. So before I do that, I want to just provide you a very base, basic overview of esophageal peristalsis. So your entire GI tract is collapsed when you're not using it. So at rest, there's no contractions, all the sphincters are closed and um, the esophageal body is collapsed. And so the act of swallowing, of course, is going to change and instigate peristalsis. And um, that will lead to immediate relaxation of your upper and your lower uh, esophageal sphincters, um, UES and LES respectively, followed by uh, you know, the peristalsis of the esophageal body. So what happens when people have derangements of esophageal motility? Well, the most common symptoms that people will present to, to me in clinic will be the symptom of esophageal dysphagia. So first and foremost, they'll have a feeling like food is getting stuck, usually in the neck or the chest um, with solids, liquids, or both. Um, there can be chest discomfort with swallowing, regurgitation, both you know during the day and regurgitation of food from hours ago at night if it's lodged in the esophagus. And that's oftentimes associated with weight loss. So fortunately, as a gastroenterologist, there's a lot of diagnostic tools in our arsenal that we can use to really get a good overview of what esophageal function is like. And I want to start off with what the gold standard of um, esophageal motility testing is, and it's really the esophageal manometry. So this is a relatively newer technology. I've developed it within you know, the past 50 years or so, and it's not the most comfortable test. So it involves a thin, flexible catheter that is inserted, inserted into the patient's nose while they're fully awake. And while that catheter is in place, um, you have the patient swallow water about 10 to 20 times, um, first while they're lying supine and then while they're elevated. And those pressure sensors will allow us to um, get a better sense of the timing and the amplitude, the vigor of every swallow, um, and give us a sense of whether or not there's normal or, of course, abnormal peristalsis. Another great complementary tool, which you're probably all very familiar with, is the timed barium esophagram. And so, again, we use this as one of many options. Um, and like I said, it's a complementary test. Um, not as sensitive as manometry and looking for um, abnormal peristalsis and motility, but the, uh, you know, the great radiologists here at Stanford are really um, detailed in commenting on peristaltic patterns, whether or not the esophageal appears dilated, which could definitely signify some kind of motility disorder, external compression. Um, and then you can get a time swallow, so they'll, they'll time how long for, it takes for that barium column to enter into the stomach. And then at the very end, we almost always ask for a barium hill study. So that involves a patient swallowing a 13 millimeter barium tablet. And then the radiologist will comment whether or not that enters into the esophagogastric junction, junction into the stomach. Um, and so that gives you a sense of whether or not food particulate that are 13 millimeter or above can really enter into the, the, you know, through into the stomach easily. And of course, as a gastroenterologist, it goes without saying, we of course perform a ton of upper endoscopy. And, um, you know, this really gives us a better structural evaluation and mucosal evaluation, right? So we look for anatomical issues. You know, we look for Zenker's diverticula. We look for peptic strictures, uh, webs, um, of course, esophagitis related to severe poorly controlled reflux, um, or another condition called eosinophilic esophagitis, which is a very common cause of dysphagia in young ma males, as well as the presence of a hiatal hernia. Um, so these really provide us great real-time answers as to what may be going on um, and, of course, allows us to um, perform biopsy acquisition at the same time. The newest kind of kit on the block is something that we perform during an upper endoscopy. It's called an endoflip. Um, and just for the sake of time, I'm just going to provide you a really basic overview of what it does. But it's a very 
a soft flexible balloon that we insert into uh, through the mouth um, after we perform a routine endoscopy. So the patient is still sedated. And while that balloon is sitting at the uh, lower esophageal sphincter, we inflate it at various volumes. And through this technology called impedance planimetry, this uh, technology will provide us with various um, parameters. And one is the diameter of the lower esophageal sphincter at, the, at these vari uh, various volumes. Another is the cross-sectional area of the lower esophageal sphincter, um, as well as pressures. And using this calculation, um, we look at something called the distensibility index. The DI is gives us a gestalt of whether or not the sphincter is relaxing normally or abnormally. And we use uh, a, a marker more or less of two. Anything below two is definitively abnormal, and anything below uh, above three is definitively normal. So um, we use this procedure a lot um, it, during endoscopy. Um, some of our gastrointestinal surger surgeons who also perform this a lot when they're doing um, certain surgeries um, to give us a sense of whether or not their surgery was successful. So it's a great, again, nice complementary tool that we have in our arsenal to get a better sense of esophageal function. So what do we do once we get all, you know, all that testing done on our patients? How do we interpret all that? So there's a consortium called the Chicago Consortium, and they meet every few years, and they create new guidelines of how to basically diagnose esophageal motility disorders. So once we kind of ruled out all the stru structural stuff, and we see uh, abnormalities on manometry, then we basically can kind of subcategorize um, disorders into two big overarching categories. So disorders of EGJ outflow, may, basically meaning your lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing all the way. And then disorders of peristalsis, the esophageal body is not pumping. And of course, there's going to be a combination of both of those disorders. So for example, I'm sorry, the text is so small, but on the top left, you'll see achalasia. And achalasia is technically, you know, an EGJ outflow issue. But to make the diagnosis of achalasia, you have to have abnormal peristalsis. That's part of the diagnostic criteria. So, but this is kind of a nice way to just kind of visualize the di various disorders. And for the remainder of this talk, um, I'm going to try to uh, go through as many as I can. So one of the hallmark diagnoses that we see here a lot at, at Stanford is something called achalasia, which I already alluded to. Two problems, right? The LES is not relaxing and the esophageal body is not moving at all. So why do people get this? Well, we're not really sure, but we're thinking it's likely some kind of post inflammatory process, whether it's autoimmune, but of course in this pandemic, post-pandemic area, we see a lot of post-infectious kind of phenomena occurring. So there's some kind of immunological change that occurs that leads to these degeneration of ganglion cells within the plexus um, in the lower esophageal sphincter and throughout the esophageal body so that it's not relaxing anymore and the esophageal body is not moving anymore. It's not very common, but of course, Stanford, you know, we see a ton of this. Um, it crosses both uh, genders and across all ages. And the classic, classic presentation is this kind of smoldering, chronic years of this dysphagia to both solids and liquids. And over time, patients almost always lose weight. They initially think, oh, it's a little bit of reflux here and there. Um, but they truly do have dysphagia and more intraesophageal reflux, not reflux coming from the stomach, right? And then dis, uh, uh, regurgitation as well. So this is kind of the textbook kind of finding. You know, you can see here outlined on the left all the different you know tools and you know that we use to diagnose this disorder. But um, you know, I just thought this was a beautiful image of what a barium esophagram could look like in pretty advanced achalasia. But um, again, bariums are not the most um, sensitive study. You could see the normal esophagus is um, um, in up to a third of patients with achalasia. But with chronic un untreated disease, you can get this severe narrowing. And because there's fair failure of the LES to rela relax and poor peristalsis, the, es the esophagus basically dilates over time. And that can be very troublesome even after uh, 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 um, surgery. Um, but like I said, manometry is really the gold standard. Um, I've outlined what uh, I reminded you of what a normal looks like on the top right. There's three different types of achalasia, and I'm not going to go into the nuances of what the differences are. But you can see, though, just anything, uh, all those, all three types look definitively different from what's on the top right over there. And so the esophageal peristalsis is essentially um, impaired, and then your lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxing anymore. 
And I'm sorry to be so gruesome. Thankfully, most of you have already eaten today, but um, this is the patient of mine that I scoped. And it's really common to see old food just sitting there in the esophagus. Um, and I know it's hard, harder to appreciate with these pictures, but the esophagus, there's zero, zero motility. You see just kind of a boggy esophagus, no movement. It's dilated in advanced cases. And then subjectively, you'll feel a little bit of pressure when you're um, resistance with the scope as you're trying to enter the lower esophageal sphincter. So again, sorry about that. Um, all right. Well, how do we treat this? Well, think this is one of these diagnoses that we kind of always get excited about because we can really help our patients very quickly, unlike a lot of disorders that we see in our clinic. So myotomy is a treatment where we basically are opening up that lower esophageal sphincter so it's not tight, so it's able to relax. And historically, we really had to rely on our gastrointestinal surgeons to perform this. Uh, but now, um, using the same kind of techniques that are used for um, the Z poems that Dr. Nguyen had uh, mentioned. Um, it's now done endoscopically, less than a 24 hour stay, really great outcomes with something called a poem, a per oral endoscopic myotomy. So we have um, a few physicians in my department that perform this routinely. Um, and um, it's not ever going to restore that peristalsis, but you'll at least have food with the help of gravity entering into the stomach. Um, more antiquated procedures that we still do here once in a while are um, really aggressive dilations. Um, and then Botox of the lo lower esophageal sphincter can provide some temporary relief. So people that are, you know, end stage cancer may not, you know, uh, do well with um, surgery. Um, we can offer at least some kind of temporizing um, treatment like a Botox. I'm not going to go into detail but a, about a poem. Um, in our patients that are come from countries where this, uh, where that uh, mostly Latin America, you want to think about mimickers. Not something that I've actually come across in my practice yet, but there is something called Chagas disease that is caused by the Reduvid bug transmitting uh, something called Trypanosoma cruzi. And this bug is very interesting. It can basically infiltrate any organ system throughout your whole body. But um, particularly in the GI tract, it can it can really just destroy the ganglion cells of the esophagus, small intestine, and colon, and essentially cause um, agalasia. Um, other mimickers, um, lung cancer, it, you can physically get impingement of a mass onto the lower esophageal sphincter. And then of course, people that get reflux surgery where they're wrapping some of the stomach around the, the LES, they'll, they can look like agalasia. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but I just want to familiarize you all with other disorders of, of motility that we see all the time in our practice. For the majority of what I'm going to discuss, um, you know, it's diag we diagnose these by, by, by doing manometry, but what's essential is that patients will have to have uh, symptoms. So we, if, if patients just incidentally have have these findings. We see this a lot actually in our lung transplant patients, but they don't have any symptoms, then no further follow-up is warranted. But anyway, EGJ outflow obstruction is incredibly common. And what it means is that you have normal peristalsis, but the LES is not relaxing all the way. So patients will oftentimes have dysphagia, uh, post-cardiac, uh, 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 I'm sorry, non-cardiac chest pain postprandially. Um, and treatment is oftentimes directed at the lower esophageal sphincter, or we'll use smooth muscle relaxants. Um, to help relax the esophageal, esophageal sphincter. Similar to that, um, I'm mean, sorry, different to, contrast to that is the diffuse esophageal spasm. So your sphincter is working just fine, but your peristalsis is abnormal. They're very, what we call simultaneous, they're very quick. And so um, they can feel like a spasming sensation, again, post uh, prandial chest pain, dysphagia. Um, so um, it's very rare we can see of the spasming on um, barium, but I, sorry, it's covered up by the LES, but I thought that was kind of fascinating. But anyway, um, treatment is really directed at trying to relax that muscle. Um, in very mild cases, I'll just use peppermint altoids preprandially. Um, in more advanced cases, I'll use medications, primarily blood pressure medications, like nifedipine, diltiazam, sublingual nitrate if patients can tolerate it. And then um, sildenafil is now a lot more affordable and that can help relax the smooth muscle. Um, a kind of similar, uh, uh, kind of clinically similar condition is something called hypercontractile. It's also known as jackhammer. This is where the esophageal contractions are very strong. And patients will go to the ER thinking they're having a heart attack. I mean, that's how much it hurts. Um, it happens with swallowing. 
And so um, very similar, we try to treat, try to treat it with um, just in the same way we treat spasm, we try to relax that sphincter. Sometimes we do uh, Botox injections, but um, outcomes are not that great. Um, so what if you have the opposite problem? So instead of the, the peristaltic patterns being too strong, they're actually really weak. Um, and that's very problematic, right? So we see this a lot in our rheumatological patients. And so this is called absent contractility. So obviously there's that sea of blue. There's none of that beautiful movement like we saw on that normal manometry. And unlike achalasia though, the LES is not tight. It's incredibly relaxed or hypotensive. These patients are very high risk. And all my scleroderma patients, I'm extremely um, mindful because that they don't you know, fall through the cracks because they're at increased risk of reflux and um, increased risk of esophageal cancer. And of you know, all it takes is one case in your, in your, you know, in your lifetime to really just never forget to, to make sure that these patients are getting screened regularly for esophageal cancer. So these patients have no con contractility and high, high risk of reflux. And they need to be on max dose acid reflux medication um, and then re regularly scoped. Um, sometimes people have just kind of weak contractions. They're not absent, but they're just really weak. And that can be secondary to reflux. Um, also can just happen as a circumstance of age, unfortunately. Um, and in those patients, it's really hard. I mean, you can't really restore that peristalsis, but you can really just try your best to optimize reflux therapy to ensure that it's not exacerbating their ineffective motility. So last but not least, this is my last slide. I want to make sure that you're all aware that opiates can cause essentially almost every disorder, <laughs> including achalasia, um, um, that I described today. So we try our best to try to, to uh, perform diagnostic testing off opiates, but that can be really difficult um, for patients. So just always be mindful of that when you see patients um, in your practice with soft gel dysphagia, you know, just ask them if they're taking opiates because that could certainly be causing dysphagia. Um, and then in conclusion, of course, diagnostic testing is paramount to evaluate these patients. And of course, treatment is directed at, at um, treating the underlying costs. So that's all I have. Thank you so much.